Archimedes and the Door of Science by Janine Bendrick. Chapter 12. The War Machines of Archimedes. Under the reign of King Herio, Cyprus was peaceful and prosperous. The city was spacious and beautiful. The markets were filled with goods. The docks and shipyards were crowded and bustling. But all around Cyprus, in the Mediterranean, there was war and there was always fighting between one and another of the city-states of Greece. The fiercest struggle was between the two great powers of the Mediterranean, Rome and Carthage. Carthage was a great city on the Mediterranean coast of Africa. She had colonies in Spain and controlled almost all of Sicily except Cyprus. The ships of Carthage had mastery of all the western Mediterranean Sea. Any foreign vessels they caught sailing there were rammed and sunk. On land, Carthage was pushing steadily eastward and taking over all of Sicily. But Rome, too, was growing more and more powerful. One by one, her legions had captured the Greek city-states in Italy. The Romans and the Carthaginians trying to find a way to divide the Mediterranean between themselves, made an agreement. They decided that no Carthaginian ships should trade on the ports of Italy, and no Roman ships should enter the ports of Sicily. But look at the map again. It angered the Roman merchants to be so close to the busy, prosperous ports of Sicily and not to be allowed to trade there. So if we see Sicily is right in the end of Italy. And the Carthaginians could see that if they cut off the Strait of Messina, they would cut off the Romans on the west coast of Italy from their own ports on the east coast. To get around the bottom of Italy, the Romans had either to sail through the Strait of Messina or go all the way around Sicily into the Carthaginian-controlled western Mediterranean. King Herio knew that sooner or later Cyprus was going to be caught in the war between Rome and Carthage and he was terribly worried. How could Cyprus defend herself? True, she had an alliance with Rome, but the Romans were fighting in so many places. Would they be able to spare the men and ships to protect Cyprus against the mighty fleet of Carthage? Many times, Hero discussed the situation with Archimedes. See how we are situated, he said, here on this peninsula. We can be cut off so completely that no help can come to us from our allies. Cyprus has been taken by siege before. I beg of you, Archimedes, help me make plans for defending the city. Archimedes shook his head impatiently. I am being an old man, he said, and there is still so much I have to do, so much I want to find out. I have no time to play at war like a boy or with the toys of war. Besides, science is, to me, something to make men grow, not to destroy them. But Herio persisted for days and weeks and months. He would let Archimedes have no peace. At last, he used the argument that had always worked. Think what you'll be doing for the cause of science, Archimedes, he pleaded. Think what it would mean if a man of science could provide the means to defend a city when the men of arms could not. Finally, Archimedes agreed. And once he started, his mind was crowded with ideas for machines to defend the city. He would use all he knew about machines. Mechanics, excuse me. Whoever those future attackers were, if they ever came, they would have some surprises. He made drawing after drawing, and steadily the machines were built by the workmen of the king, then stored away. 
Hirio commanded that Archimedes' machines were always to be kept in good working order. No ropes were to be allowed to fray. Rotting wood must be replaced, no metal must rust, and there must always be men trained to use these machines. Even if they are not used for twenty years, he said, or even for a lifetime, men must always be trained to use these machines. The time will come when Cycrus will need them. Hirio was right. He never saw the time during his life, but in the year 215 B.C. Hirio died, and his grandson, mm -mm, Hieronymus, inherited the crown. But Hieronymus did not hold power long. Hypocrite, hypocrites, traitor who had been bribed by Carthage murdered Hieronymus and seized control of the city. Then hypocrites broke the long allegiance between Rome and Cyprus and made a new allegiance with Carthage. At once the Romans made war on Cyprus. They sent a fleet and army against the city under the command of Marcellus, one of the greatest of the Roman generals. Marcellus not only was a Roman, who wanted to take Cyprus forever out of the hands of Carthage and make the strait of Mensa safe for Roman ships, but he was a bitter personal enemy of the treacherous Hippocrates. Setting up his camp near the wall of the city, Marcellus prepared to attack Cyprus from the land and from the sea. He had a great fleet of sixty towering galleys, each with six banks of oars. In his fleet was a huge war machine built to cast stones and darts at the city. The machine was so big that it was supported on a bridge of planks placed across the deck of eight ships chained together. When the people of Cyprus heard about the fleet and army of Marcellus, they were terribly frightened, and they called upon Hippocrates to save them. Hippocrates was terrified. Where were his friends from Carthage who had promised to come to his aid? He certainly did not have enough trained soldiers to stand against Marcellus. Of course, he remembered. There were those men trained in the use of Archimedes' machines. He would have to use those men and machines, although he did not understand them. He had the uneasy feeling, too, that Archimedes held him in great contempt. Still, the men must love Cyprus, and he had the reputation of being a wizard of some sorts. Hippocrates started to send for Archimedes, then changed his mind and went to himself. He questioned him closely about the machines. You can depend on them, said Archimedes, quietly. I shall direct their use myself. With his robes flapping and his beard flowing in the wind, Archimedes was everywhere about the city, placing the machines. Here is the account of the battle as it was written by the great Roman historian Plutarch. When, therefore, the Romans assaulted the walls at two places at once, fear and consternation stupefied the Cyprusians, believing that nothing was able to resist that violence and those forces. But when Archimedes began to ply his engines, he at once shot against the land forces all sorts of missile weapons and immense masses of stones that came down with incredible noise and violence, against which no man could stand, for they knocked down those upon whom they fell in heaps, breaking all of their ranks and files. In the meantime, Huge poles thrust out from the walls over the ships sank some by the great weights which they let down from on high upon them. Others they lifted up into the air by an iron hand or beak like crane speak. And when they had drawn them up by the pro and set them on end upon the prop, they plugged them to the bottom of the sea, or else the ships drawn by engines within, and whirled about, were dashed against steep rocks 
that stood juttering out under the walls with great destruction of the soldiers who were aboard them. The ship was frequently lifted up to great heights in the air, a dreadful thing to behold, and was rolled to and fro and kept swinging until the mariners were all thrown out, when at length it was dashed against the rocks or let fall. At the engines, which Marcellus brought upon the bridge of ships, which was called Sambuca, from some resemblance it had to an instrument of music, while it was as yet approaching the wall, there was discharged a piece of rock of ten talents weight, then a second and a third, which striking upon it with an immense force and a noise like thunder broke all its foundations to pieces, shook out all its fastenings, and completely dislodged it from the bridge. So Marcellus, doubtful, what counsel to pursue drew off his ships to a safer distance and sounded a retreat to his forces on land. They then took a resolution of coming up under the walls, if it was possible, in the night, thinking that Archimedes used ropes stretched at length in playing his engines. The soldiers would now be under the shot, and the darts would for want of sufficient distance to throw them, fly over their heads without effect. But Archimedes, it appeared, had long before framed for such occasion engines accommodation to any distance, and shorter weapons, and had made numerous small openings in the walls through which, with engines of a shorter range, unexpected blows were inflicted on the sultans. Thus, when they who thought to deceive the defenders, came close up to the walls. Instantly a shower of darts and other missile weapons was again cast upon them, and when stones came tumbling down perpendicularly upon their heads, and as it were, the whole wall shot out arrows at them, they retreated. And now again, as they were going off, arrows and darts of long rage inflicted a great slaughter among them, and their ships were driven one against another, while they themselves were not able to retaliate in any way, for Archimedes had proved, provided and fixed most of his engines immediately under the wall, whence the Romans, seeing that mischief overwhelmed them from no visible means, began to think they were fighting with the gods. Yet Marcellus escaped unhurt, and derining his own artif artificers and engineers. What? he said. Must we give up fighting with this geometrical Briarius, who plays pitch and toss with our ships, and with the multitude of darts which he showers at a single moment upon us? really outdoes the hundred-hand giants of mythology, and doubtless the rest of the Cycrusans were but the body of Archimedes, designs one soul moving and governing all, for laying aside all other arms, with this alone they infested the Romans and protected themselves. In fine, when such terror has seized upon the Romans that if they did but see a little rope, or a piece of wood from the wall, instantly crying out that there it was. Again, Archimedes was about to let fly some engine at them. They turned their backs and fled. Marcellus desisted from conflict and assault, putting all his hopes in a long siege. Did you wonder how Marcellus knew who was responsible for the machines? All educated men knew Archimedes of Cyprus and this could be the work of no other hand. One later account of this battle says that Archimedes also placed on the wall huge concave mirrors made of highly polished metal. He had designed the mirrors as parables, which caught and focused the rays of the sun so accurately some of our modern lenses work the same way, that when the rays were beamed, at any of the wooden ships in Marcel's fleet, for
for a short time the ship would catch fire. Historians are not sure whether these burning mirrors were actually a part of Archimedes' defense of Cyprus, as they were not mentioned in any immediate account of the battle, as the other war machines were. But the machines was later described in detail, and almost 900 years after, a French scientist, Boffin, made a mirror following the description and succeeded in setting fire to a wood 150 feet away and melting lead at a distance of 140 feet. During the battle, Archimedes was everywhere at once. No longer did he think of his machines as toys, but as giant working models of geometry and mechanisms, mechanics. He had used levers and pulleys, cranks, screws, and cogwheels. He had used not only manpower to work machines, but air power and water power. He had used the knowledge he had of balance and centers of gravity. He had used the things he knew about different kinds of curves and about applying force over distance. And now Archimedes enjoyed his practical geometry lesson. He was only sorry that King Herodo was not there to see it. He often walked along the walls where the machines stood ready waiting for Marcellus to return with his fleet and legions. But Marcellus was a wise general. He had given up on the idea of capturing Cyprus by attack and instead block the city by land and sea.